All right, this will be class number nine. By now you should have taken your quiz from the previous class, and we'll take up where we left off. In our, um, what we're covering is what's on seminar part four of my series. And the last couple weeks we talked about, or last class we talked about survival of the fittest. It really doesn't happen. It's actually survival of the luckiest. So let's take up with a, a, just an illustration to help you see how that some people can make good observations and still come to the wrong conclusions. Maybe you heard the story about the scientists who were going to see how far the frog could jump. They put this big old frog down and they said, jump frog! That big old bullfrog jumped 80 inches. They brought the frog back to the starting line and cut off one leg. Said, jump frog! He only jumped 70 inches. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump frog! He only jumped 60 inches. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump frog! He only jumped 50 inches. They brought him back, cut off his last leg, and said, jump frog! You know, they expected he'd go about 40 inches. He actually jumped zero. The frog didn't move. They were amazed. They tried the experiment again. Uh, new frog got the same results. They yelled and screamed and coaxed and said, come on, jump, frog, jump! Frog didn't move. So these brilliant scientists looked at their graph and they were just confused. How could this happen? So they concluded the frog jumped less as the legs were removed. Now that's a good observation. That's true. Then they said, see, what we proved is that a frog with no legs goes deaf. No, <laughs> bad conclusion. <laughs> okay. Good observation, bad conclusion. And many people are guilty of this. They make good observations and come to the wrong conclusion. For instance, they did their experiment with the fruit flies. They got these poor flies and they nuked them and microwaved them and x-rayed them and radiated them and everything else. And they got mutated babies, of course. Some of the flies were born with uh, uh, curled wings. They fly around, couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with uh, no wings. What do you call that? A crawl? You can't fly. So they raised all these flies in the laboratory and got all sorts of mutated flies, but they still got a fly. And here, just recently in the newspaper, they said, uh, Darwin is as fit as ever. Here we see evolution in action. Right here, two flies. This is the proof for evolution. One fly has wings that are a little bit bigger than the other fly. Is that proof for evolution? <laughs> Wait a minute. It's still a fly. You might have a fly getting better nutrition and able to grow bigger, or you know, he's in an area where the larger wingspan is necessary for some reason. Maybe he's in higher altitude and he needs you know bigger wings to because the air is thinner. I don't know, but it's still a fly. That's an example of variation within the kind. That would be an example of microevolution. But some poor student's going to read this and think, wow, they have proof for evolution. I saw it in the paper. <laughs> no, they have proof for variations after their kind. The scientists concluded that all the mutations observed with the fruit flies produced flies that were inferior to the original fly. That's a good observation. And then they said, you know, this proves that flies have evolved as far as they can go. No, that's a bad conclusion. Jump, frog, jump. <laughs> yes, all the mutants you got were inferior to the original grandpa fly. Maybe that proves that God made the flies right to begin with. It doesn't prove they've evolved as far as they can go. It, they were already fine before you started messing with them. That's what it proves. Then they did the thing with the peppered moth. Now this was, this was hilarious. They counted the moths on the trees. So the story goes. This must have been a government project, go around counting the moths on the trees. They discovered it was 95% light-colored moths and 5% black. Now these are two colors of the exact same species of moth. Biston betulia, whatever it is. Better, Biston betularia. I didn't take Latin, I took French. It took me further than I took it. But, uh, there's two colors of the same kind of moth. Most of them were light-colored because the trees were light-colored and they blended in. The birds are more likely to see a dark moth on a light tree, so they would be easier to find to eat. That's how the story goes. Then, when they began burning coal in the factories in England back in the Industrial Revolution, 
they got all this coal coming out, turning the trees black around the factories. So they counted the moths again around the factories and found out it was 95% black moths and 5% light. And they said, see, evolution. The white moth evolved into a black moth. No, that's not what happened at all. Now, it turns out the whole story is a fake. It didn't happen at all. But even if it were true, the ratio of the population shifted. The moth didn't change. It started off as a moth. It ended up as a moth. Yep, that proves we all came from a rock, all right? I mean, what more evidence could you possibly need? <laughs> I don't see how. They don't see how dumb that is. Turns out, after 40 years of watching the trees, two moths were found on the tree trunks in 40 years. So what the guy did to take the picture to go in your textbook, he glued dead moths to the trees and took the picture as proof for evolution. They were dead and glued on the tree. Then he took a dead bird and stuffed it and glued it on the tree like it's about to eat the colored moth that he wanted it to eat. The whole thing was staged. It was fake. It didn't happen. But even if it would have happened, what would they have proven? Well, let's see. The moth population ratio shifted from mostly white to mostly black. Okay? That would have been true. Moth population was able to adapt to the new environment. Okay, that would have been a good observation also. This helps prove we all came from a rock. Oh, no, <laughs> now there's a bad conclusion. Okay, jump, frog, jump. Um, what you would have concluded is that God made the moth with the ability to produce a variety of babies. Some dark, some light, so some, they're always, some of them are going to survive no matter what happens to the background. That's proof for creation. Then they tell the students to get a large sheet of black paper, one meter square. I like to kick this dog every time I walk by. All the new textbooks that I'm aware of are metric. I understand the metric system very thoroughly. I taught physics. I'll take a metric quiz against anybody you know. But I'm not sure I want a kid coming to help build my house that doesn't know what a 2 by 4 is. Okay, so if you're a patriot, make your paper 39.37 inches instead. And then it says get 200 white circles and 200 black circles and cut them out and throw them on the paper. And then they say, okay, boys and girls, we're going to see how many you can pick up in one minute. Go. Well, of course, you're going to pick up the white circles off the black paper. You don't need to be a genius to figure this out. And they're going to say, see, this proves evolution. No, teacher, this proves we got extra money to waste in our school district. We just cut up a whole bunch of good paper and threw it on the floor. <laughs> now we've got to pay the janitor to pick up the ones we couldn't find. <laughs> That's not proof for evolution. It's proof the Creator was pretty smart. He put this ability in these moths to produce a variety of colors of babies so some will always survive. The peppered moth is actually excellent proof of design. See, God wants to make sure some survive no matter what happens. And yet they give the kids the idea that this is evidence for evolution. Actually, it's called planning ahead. Did you know General Motors and Ford and I believe Toyota puts a heater and an air conditioner in some of their cars. Now, wait a minute. Doesn't a heater and an air conditioner do the opposite thing? One heats it up, one cools it down. Why would you put both in the same car? Well, because they don't know if it's going to go to hot climate or cold climate, right? It's planning ahead for General Motors to put both of them in the car. And it's planning ahead for God to put both genes in the moth population. So if it lands in an area where dark survives better, okay, then the dark ones survive. If it lands in an area where light ones survive, then the light ones survive. That's not evolution. That's planning ahead. Now look at this sentence carefully. This textbook uh, right here, Holt Biology, is absolutely loaded with evolution propaganda. They tell the kids, we're going to learn to think critically. Now look at this sentence carefully. This is the book used at, you go to uh, Woodham? Woodham uses this book. Okay? They tell the kids, think critically. Do you think humans are still evolving? Now what kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> no, wait a minute. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, then I'm still doing it. 
That type of question cannot be answered with a yes or no. The question assumes you were beating your wife, right? So the question says, have you stopped beating your wife yet? What if you never did? How can you answer this question? Go back and look at the question they asked the kids in high school. Do you think humans are still evolving? Doesn't that question assume that evolution happened? What if a kid doesn't believe in evolution at all? How is he supposed to answer that question? Look at the next one. How might the dinosaurs' body heat problems have led to their extinction? There are two assumptions in this question. Who can see them? They're assuming dinosaurs are extinct, right? And they're assuming they have body heat problems. So by the time they get to the question, now the kid's got to answer this for some, you know, homework. How's he supposed to answer that? These kind of questions are not teaching the students how to think. They are teaching them what to think. These kind of questions are used in Soviet schools for indoctrination. Do you think communism is uh, uh, a great form of government? <laughs> questions that the question is phrased to get the, get the answer that they want. Most of the surveys they do for these political things in election years, they phrase the question a certain way to get the answer that they want to make the poll look like, you know, everybody's for their candidate. And I, I, don't, I, would, I wouldn't trust the polls at all. I don't care what the polls say. I'm going to vote for the best guy who I think is the best guy, and if he has zero chance of winning, okay. My job is to do what's right. And if it hair lips the devil, well, well tough, okay? I'm going to do what's right. If nobody likes it, okay. I've got to stand before God and say, God, I did what was right. I'm not going to vote for some guy because he has the best chance of winning. You vote, you do what's right, period, okay? This uh, chapter in Heath Biology, I don't know if I got that one here with me, probably. Got a bunch more on the floor. Anyway, I got thousands of textbooks, well, hundreds of textbooks. This one says, we have evidence of evolution from structure. Now watch this carefully. This is called the homology argument. And this is one you need to know for the quiz. Homology, homo means the same, and ology is the study of. Geology, study of geo, earth. Biology, study of bio, life. The biosphere is the living part of the world. Um, homology is the study of things that are the same. So they're going to say structures of different animals are the same and therefore they must have evolved. They will show you four limbs or front arms called the four limb of different animals and they'll say the human has a humerus, a radius, and ulna. Okay? And then you have the carpals and phalanges and you know, fingers. Um, they're going to say, see boys and girls, the cat has the same design and so does the whale. He has a radius and an ulna. Oh, well, who named him? The whale? You know, who decided to call these bones this? <laughs> I'm sure the whale didn't decide that. But they show the students examples of different animals and say they have a similar forelimb structure, which is true. I agree. But look what they say here now. Notice first the overall similarity, then the difference in details. What you are doing is what scientists do in comparative anatomy the study of the structure of different organisms. Comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. Different kinds of organisms, such as a bird, a horse, or human, share similar structures. That's true. As you have just observed, each animal in Figure 12-3 has a four-limb structure that is a variation of a common pattern. I agree. I, I'm with them so far. I agree. The commonality suggests that these and all other vertebrate animals are all related. Oh, now right there, they just lost me. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. Oh, now they really lost me. What's another explanation? That why would you say all these animals have similar four-limb structures? They have a common designer. Doesn't prove a common ancestor. Couldn't it be a common designer? Did you know the Honda Accord and the Honda Civic and the Honda Prelude have thousands of parts that are interchangeable? 
they all evolved from a skateboard. I mean, that's proof, right? <laughs> oh, no, they have the same guys designing them. That's what it proves. And how they get by with telling the students that this is evidence for evolution blows my mind. This is just as much evidence for a common designer. But the students are never told that. These books only show one possible explanation. It is true there are similar forelimb structures on many animals. This is true. Now what does that prove? They're going to tell you it proves evolution. No, it's evidence for design. It's evidence for creator. You got to admit, it works pretty good. I mean, the wrist and the hand and the arm, this is an amazing structure, what it can do. If you could invent a machine that could do what your arm can do, you would be a multi-gazillionaire. Nobody's been able to make a machine that is as efficient as your arm. It's unbelievable. All the different motions it can make, incredible. The dexterity, it's design. But they're going to say, boys and girls, many animals have a similar forelimb structure. I agree. They must have had a common ancestor. Oh, eh, I disagree. This helps prove we came from a rock. Oh, now I really disagree. <laughs> it doesn't prove any such thing. Poor students, though. I mean, what's a freshman kid supposed to do in high school? The teacher says this is evidence for evolution. The book says it's evidence for evolution. He's going to believe it. He's going to be tested on it. It's just unfair. That's not an education. That's being indoctrinated. This textbook says we have evidence from development. Well, there aren't too many things about this whole theory that make me any angrier than this. So I'm going to try to stay calm while I explain it to you. This uh, BSCS, Biological Science, by the way, let me stop right here and say the BSCS series of textbooks, there's several different publishers. This is Holt, this is Harcourt, uh, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, HBJ, they usually abbreviate it. Here's uh, Prentice Hall, many different publishers of textbooks. They just want one thing, money. They're trying to sell their books, okay? And so they will put in there whatever the people are buying. And if we get some intelligent folks on the textbook selection committee to say, look, your book teaches evolution, we don't want that in there. I mean, let's suppose you were the chief executive officer, officer the CEO at Holt Reinhardt Winston. And you started getting letters from all across the country from people on school boards and said, look, we did not buy your book this year because you have too much evolution in it. Well, what are you going to do next year? You take it out. But see, the Christians are busy going to church and singing praises, and we should be, okay? But the humanists, there aren't not very many of them. Six to ten percent of the population is atheistic, that's all. But they're busy sending letters and lobbying government officials and sending letters to textbook publishers saying, we want more evolution in the textbooks. They'll spend their time getting on the committee to select the books that all of the kids in our county have to use. And I've gone down to the school board meetings many times and gone to textbook selection committee meetings, and it's tragic to see the high number of evolutionists, very unproportional to the population. But they're on the committee to select the books that all of the kids in the county have to use. Anyway, BSCS is one of the worst there is as far as teaching evolution. If you have an opportunity to choose between books, that would be the last one I would choose. Anything published by uh, the BSCS Corporation. Okay, this was clear back in 1978, but look what this book says. The similarity between early stages in the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. This is called the uh, embryology argument for evolution. Here's a Merrill Earth Science 93 edition. They show the little folds of skin under the chin of this embryo, a baby developing inside the mother. And then it says it has gill pouches. Now hold it. Are those gills? You know, a fish has gills so he can breathe in the water. Those are not gills. If you want to memorize how evolution supposedly happened, just look at the, right there on the word farm. F-A-R-M. It's an acrostic. Fish, amphibian, reptiles, mammals. They say fish evolved first and then slowly became amphibian. Amphibian means it has two lives. It lives in the water part of its life and then it lives on land part of its life. Okay? Then fish, amphibian, reptiles, lizards, etc., 
and then finally they turned into birds and mammals. So just the word farm, F-A-R-M, will be, help you memorize the order of how evolution supposedly happened. So here they're saying the human embryo has gills like a fish. What they're going to teach here, this embryology argument, you can see the word there, embryology, the study of embryos, um, they're going to say that the embryo in the mother goes through those four stages before it becomes a human. So when it first starts to grow, it's actually in the fish stage with gills. Those are not gills, okay? This whole thing is a lie. Those little folds of skin actually develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. They are not gills. They're not even vestigial gills. They're just a little fold of skin. That's all they are. I've seen fat people that have five or six chins. They cannot breathe through any of them except the top one. Okay, those are not gills. <laughs> They're just folds of skin, that's all. What happened back in 1860? This man, Ernst Haeckel, you need to know his name, write this down, Ernst Haeckel, he was an embryology professor. He taught at the university in Germany, a university called the University of Jena, J-E-N-A. Ernst Haeckel was an embryology professor. Students would take his class and they would study embryos of different animals. You cut open the fish and take out the you know, undeveloped fish eggs, you know, and then you cut, look at them under the microscope and you study the different animals in the embryonic stage to see how they develop. A very fascinating study, by the way. Ernst Haeckel taught this stuff at the University of Jena. Then in 1860, he read this book, Charles Darwin's book. This book came out in 1859. Now in 1859, Russia was still controlled by a czar, 1850s, 1860s, yeah, up until 1917. You know who the czar was in 18, doesn't matter, 59, I wouldn't know. but. Uh, during the 1850s, slavery was still going on here in America. When did the Civil War start? 1861. 1861. So in 1859, when this book came out, we still had slavery. The title to the book is The Origin of Species, but there's more to it. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the struggle for life. See, Darwin was a racist. We'll get into more of that later. He thought there are favored races. One race must be better than the others. And Ernst Haeckel read this book. Now, Ernst Haeckel was in Germany. Guess what happened to the Germans over the next 70 years? They became what they thought was the master race. And this book had a very profound influence on the rise of Adolf Hitler. He thought the blonde haired blue-eyed Norwegians and Germans were superior. They were the Aryan race. And this book started all that thinking. 1860, Ernst Haeckel read this book and it changed his whole philosophy of life. Darwin predicted in his book that they would find evidence for his theory. All he did was come up with a theory. He said, I think all life forms have a common ancestor. Well, where's the evidence? There was none. After nine years, Ernst Haeckel started getting worried. You know, I, I like this theory, I like evolution, but I, I don't see any evidence. I think I'll make some. Ernst Haeckel took a picture, or took a drawing, of a human and a dog embryo. This is four weeks after conception. He changed the drawings and made them look very similar. Here are his fake drawings. He lied. He enlarged the head on the dog and he decreased the size of the head on the human. He changed the eye details. He changed all sorts of things. Notice how similar they look. I'll back up one and show you. There's the actual drawings. If you take time to look at the actual drawings, the right ones, Compared to his, you'll notice all sorts of changes. There they are, one on top of the other. He lied, basically. Ernst Haeckel actually did this with quite a few different animals. 
he made the drawing of a human, of a salamander, of a fish. Look how the very top row here, all of them look very similar, don't they? He made a gigantic poster of this drawing and traveled all over Germany and held seminars on evolution to prove the evolution theory. Because remember, Darwin's book came out in 1859. He read it in 1860. 1869, he started traveling and speaking on evolution to try to promote the theory. We ought to believe in this theory because here's the proof. Poof, up comes this big chart. See, look at that. All the animals are similar in the embryonic stage. And he said that proves that the human starts off as a fish. And then it becomes an amphibian. Then it becomes a reptile. And finally it becomes a human and it's born after nine months. Well, now, hold on just a minute. This uh, professor from St. George, uh, Richardson from St. George Hospital uh, Medical School in London said just a couple years ago, a set of 19th century drawings, that's Ernst Haeckel's, that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says an embryologist in Britain. Although Haeckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena. Well, that's interesting. That's where he taught. If I understand the details on the story, I may have some of the minor details uh, confused here, but I believe six professors accused Haeckel of faking these drawings, so they held a trial at the University of Jena. Professor Haeckel was on trial. He was convicted of fraud. They said, Ernst, you lied. In 1874, Ernst Haeckel was convicted of fraud. I write that date down, 1874. In 1874, the idea that the human embryo has gills was proven false. He came up with this idea in 1869. So for five years, people are teaching this. On top are Haeckel's drawings. On the bottom are actual photographs taken by Richardson of the same animal. Now either Haeckel is an extremely lousy artist <laughs> or he's a liar. His drawings on top, he said that's what the turtle looks like in the embryonic stage. I don't think so, Ernest. I mean, have you ever seen a turtle in the embryonic stage? What about the salamander? I'd say he's nowhere close, right? He just flat lied. That's all there is to it. So this was proven in 1874. It was proven that Ernst Haeckel had lied. He was, his own university convicted him of fraud. But guess what? Haeckel's exact same chart is used this year at the University of West Florida in Pensacola as evidence for evolution. It was proven wrong 125 years ago. Why would this still be in a university textbook? Guess what? The book used at your school on page 183 is still teaching the same thing, proven wrong 125 years ago. Guess what? Glencoe Biology, I've got it in my office there, still teaches the human embryo has gill pouches, proven wrong in 1874. Here's a, a biology textbook used in the Troy State University, a college textbook, still teaching them. Human embryo has gill pouches. Biology, A Journey into Life, Arms in Camp, a terrible book as far as, I mean, loaded with evolution propaganda. Look at this, look at this, says. it shows them a picture of a five to six week human embryo. But look what it says at the top, by seven months. The fetus looks from the outside like a tiny, normal baby, but it is not. What are they trying to say here? It's not a baby at seven months? Well, what is it? Seven months development? You know, a whole bunch of kids born at five and a half months survive. My son back there running the camera was born at, I think, seven months and survived. Kind of small, but he made it. And he caught up for the size, but uh, he, he made it. Kids born five and a half months old survive, 34% of them. Um, there's a 21-week-old baby. They were doing surgery 
They knew something was wrong with the baby, so inside the mother, they cut the mother open, cut the uterus open to do surgery on the baby. Baby's only five months along in development. The baby reaches out and grabs the doctor's finger. <laughs> Tell me it's not alive, okay? The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. Is that what they said? I believe he said you are with child, right? See, they want to call it a fetus because it doesn't sound like a child. It's a child the instant it's conceived. It's a human. Life begins at conception. Every doctor knows that, that knows anything. Why do they keep this lie in the textbooks? I mean, it's been proven wrong 125 years ago. Why do they want you to learn this when you take biology class? What would be the logic for keeping this lie in these textbooks? There's only one reason. Justify abortion. They don't want you to think it's a human yet. You're just killing a fish. You're just killing an amphibian, just a reptile. No, it's a human. See, the Lord uh, told the devil after he tricked Eve, you're going to crawl on your belly and eat dust the rest of your life. And he said, I'm going to, some seed of the woman is going to bruise your head. We went through all this before. How that Satan really wants to reduce the population of the world. He wants to destroy humanity. And we'll skip over all this part. You can get videotape number one for more on that. About Satan's goal to destroy the world, to, dis to, just to eliminate humans. And one of the ways to do it is by abortion. Here's a little Anna Rosa. She had her arm chopped off in a botched abortion. There's several different ways they abort the babies. One is they just inject salt solution right into the uterus, just a needle right through the outside, and, and the baby is burned by the salt. And the baby thrashes around in there and finally dies and then is re rejected by the body. Others, they, they cut the baby apart in little pieces and pull them out piece by piece. That's what they were doing with Anna Rosa. The mother was seven and a half months pregnant. Baby could have been born and survived. Cut the arm off, pulled the arm out and said, oh, well, it'll die. Well, she didn't. She survived. As far as I know, still alive today. Missing an arm. Everybody says, oh, that's terrible. Oh, I agree. What if they would have cut her head off instead? We never would have heard of Anna Rosa, would we? Do you know 4,500 babies were killed today? 4,500 more are going to be killed tomorrow. Legal abortion in America. That's just America. Wait till you see what's going on in the rest of the world. Now here in Pensacola, Florida, we've had two abortion doctors shot and killed, several clinics blown up or burned down. I didn't blow any clinics up and I didn't shoot any doctors, okay? And I don't think Jesus would do it that way either. He grew up under Roman control. He didn't go around, you know, blowing up bridges and <laughs> blowing up tanks and stuff like that. But the doctors were murderers, plain and simple. There's just no nice way to say it. They were murdering kids. And anybody that commits an abortion is committing murder. Well, I was flying back from Fort Lauderdale one time. I was preaching down there in Fort Lauderdale. I was flying home. The day, the, while I was down there in Fort Lauderdale, one of the doctors was shot and killed, Dr. Gunn. This guy killed him. Well, the next day, I was flying up to Pensacola. Right in front of me on the airplane were two ladies forget that, two women, from NOW, National Organization for Wild Women. They were coming out to Pensacola and they were going to march around town, hold up their signs, you know, pro-choice, pro-choice. They were going to put on a big demonstration in honor of this great doctor who gave his life for the cause. As we got off the plane, I'm walking down the gangway with these two ladies, uh, women, I mean, I noticed on their shirt they had in huge block letters, choice above all. So, being my mild-mannered self, I said, excuse me, ma'am, what does this mean, choice above all? She said, we believe a woman ought to have a right to choose. I said, uh, choose what? She said, choose if she wants to have an abortion. It's her body, you know. I said, well, yes, ma'am, if she wants to abort her body, I suppose that's fine. It looks to me like she wants to abort somebody else's body, though. I said, ma'am, I'm kind of curious about this. I've got three kids. I delivered one at home. I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. Uh, I'm kind of familiar with how this works. I said, tell me, why does the woman's right to choice stop at birth? If that's really what you're worried about is right freedom of choice, you know, choice above all, let's let the mother choose to kill the baby after it's born. It's a lot easier. 
a lot safer. It's dangerous to kill the baby while it's inside the mother. No telling how many women have died from, a, from legal abortions. They've got this little long, neat, like a needle with a hook on the end that they will reach in and, and tear pieces of the baby out. The baby's still alive while they're cutting it apart and pulling it out. Well, very frequently they will snag and cut a hole in the large intestine, the bowel. Now you get poisonous substances into the bloodstream and the mother dies. Thousands of women have died from legal abortions. Many thousands more have become sterile. They can never have a child again. Have one abortion and they'll never have a baby in the rest of their life because of a legalized abortion. They don't tell you about that though. Uh, I said, hey, why don't, you, uh, why don't we kill the baby after it's born? It'd be a lot safer and simpler. I got a brilliant idea. Let's, if it's really choice you're looking for, let's let the mother choose to kill the baby up until it's two years old. I know a lot of mothers with a two-year-old that have thought about it uh, several times. <laughs> hey, let's extend abortion rights up until the kid is 18. I bet they'd behave a lot better. <laughs> Look, son, one more time and I'm going to abort you. <laughs> Teacher, where's Johnny today? Well, he didn't do his homework yesterday, so his mommy aborted him. Hey, grades would skyrocket, wouldn't they? <laughs> How can we get so dumb as to believe it's okay to kill the baby? Uh, the news media and the textbooks always call them pro-choice. Look at this textbook. Pro-choice and anti-abortion demonstrators in Los Angeles. Now just think about that for a minute. Pro-choice is a nice sounding word. That's a positive. Pro-choice. Anti-abortion is a negative sounding word. This sounds bad. Nobody wants to be put in a classification of people who are anti. It's much more positive to say, I am pro-choice. This kind of rhetoric in the news media and in textbooks is all over the place, okay? And it's designed to make the poor kid go into class think, oh, I don't want to be an anti, I'd rather be a pro. It's propaganda is all it is. How about let's call them pro-death and call us pro-life? How would that be for better names? Much better. You got to watch or anti-life and pro-life. How's that? When you get into a discussion on abortion, you got to phrase your words carefully. You know, are you, don't call, don't say, "Are you pro-choice?" Say, "Oh, are you pro-death? Are you anti-life?" You know, do the same thing to them they're doing to us. Give them a taste of their own medicine, see how they like it. Um, it's always pro-choice, and it's not the issue at all. Well, the news media, though, always ignores the majority. You can get 100,000 people, and I've seen these demonstrations here in Pensacola where there are thousands of people lining the street with their signs, you know. It's a child, you know, pro-life. You have these pro-life demonstrations here in Pensacola, and you have six people that are for anti-life, that are pro-death, and the news media gives them all the coverage. These six people are going to march around town and they're going to get all the news media coverage they want because they're coming up here in honor of this doctor who got killed. Now look, the doctor shouldn't have got shot. Not by gun anyway, or Paul Hill shot one. Um, they shouldn't have done that. But why, do the, why are they treated like martyrs? Why are the doctors treated like martyrs? They were murderers. I've often asked the question, I've never gotten an answer to it. Maybe you can give me an answer. Think about it. During World War II, a bunch of the Jews were taken away and put in concentration camps. They were guarded. Hitler's soldiers were there guarding these camps. If you had gone in and shot some of the guards and rescued some of the Jews, would you be a good guy or a bad guy? You murdered the guards to save the Jews. If somebody kills a doctor and saves a baby, is he a good guy or bad guy? See, our government has put us into this lousy position of having to make that choice. This is the government's fault. Never should have had to make that choice. Now, I don't think they should have shot the doctors, okay? I think we should legislate this. I think we should put them in jail. I think we should, they should have a fair trial and then they should be executed. Anybody that commits an abortion 
Any doctor that kills a baby inside the mother is a murderer, and after a fair trial, he should be executed. I feel that strongly about it. And so do a lot of other Americans. The media can't seem to get it right. We get a call every once in a while around here. They say, Mr. Oldman, would you like to take the Pensacola News Journal? <laughs> it's hilarious. They transfer the call to me. Mr. Oldman, would you like to take the Pensacola News Journal? I say, no, ma'am, we don't have a parakeet. <laughs> she says, what? <laughs> You'll get that about Friday. You know, you put the newspaper in the bottom of your parakeet cage. <laughs> That's all it's good for, in my opinion. I don't want to support the liberal agenda. Uh, here, here I was waiting for a taxi to take me home, and these ladies, women, I mean, didn't want to talk about this anymore, pro-choice stuff, after I asked them a few questions. So uh, here's this cameraman. He showed up to film the rally. And I thought, wait a minute, come from Chicago to film this rally and there's going to be six people? How come when we had a thousand people lining the streets, you didn't show up to film that rally? Hmm. thousand people against abortion. Where were you guys then? That's why I just can't bring myself to support the liberal media. And I don't care what the news polls say. I'm going to vote for who I think is the best guy. And it doesn't matter at all, whatever the polls say. Um, the, oh, it's always pro-choice. When the kids got shot in Colorado, remember that? Right away, the news media jumped on the gun control issue. I mean, it was all over. What if we should have more gun control? The kids broke 18 gun laws when they went in there and shot everybody. Do you think five more gun laws would have stopped them? They broke 18 already. What's another gun law going to do? Nothing. Well, let's take up that. Uh, we'll take a little break here and cover this section uh, so I can calm down a little bit. And we'll get into more on this uh, news media and abortion, how it ties together right after the break. Okay, let's uh, pick on the news media just a little bit here. When the kids got shot in Colorado, they jumped on the gun control issue right away. They said, we need more gun control. I think when kids keep getting shot in our public schools, it's time to look at a couple of other questions. Number one, should we have public schools? Maybe they should all be shut down and the kids should all go to private schools. That would solve the problem. You don't hear about kids getting shot in private schools very often. <laughs> it's in the public schools. Uh, maybe the question we should consider is, since all these kids are getting shot in the public schools, should we keep teaching them evolution, which says there's no God, there are no standards, there's no absolute, there's no right and wrong? That's what evolution teaches. Maybe instead of gun control, we should discuss the issue of evolution. The kids that did the shooting were strong believers in evolution, by the way. Eric Harris and Dylan Kleibold are the ones that went around and shot everybody. Kleibold's father was a geologist, I suspect. He believed in evolution because most geologists believe the earth is billions of years old. They believe the geologic column, which is a bunch of baloney. We covered that earlier. So I suspect this had a strong influence on Kleibold, on Dylan. Uh, both Eric and Dylan were followers of Nazi teachings. The shooting took place on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They chose that day, Adolf Hitler's birthday, to bring all their guns and bombs to school. They planned this for months, to do this on Hitler's birthday. Um, Kleibold wore a shirt that said serial killer. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. Remember uh, The Origin of Species by Means of uh, Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races? Nazism, of course, was, we'll get into more of that later, how it's evolution is the foundation for racism. One race must be superior to the rest. Eric's t-shirt said natural selection. Darwin's read wrath, according to Rocky Mountain News. Where are these kids getting this philosophy anyway? They spoke German to each other in the hall at school, and Harris wore a German Nazi cross. Now, I'm part German myself, one-fourth German and three-fourths Norwegian. I'm not against I've preached in Germany three times. But Hitler was loony. Hitler was a strong believer in evolution, and so were these two boys. So when a bunch of kids get shot in public school, maybe it's time to analyze what we're teaching these kids anyway. Instead of worrying about gun control, let's talk about evolution, because that's the problem. Um, maybe the issue is, should certain criminals be publicly executed? How many people have you seen executed in your life publicly? And, I mean, real, real executions. Probably none, right? Suppose we were raised in the time of Christ in Israel. 
or and did things according to the biblical method, where if a person committed a certain crime, now nobody nobody gets the death penalty unless there are two or three witnesses, according to the Bible. Some of these people will say, well, what if some, what if an innocent man is executed? Well, that may happen today, because some people get the death penalty based on circumstantial evidence. You find their blood at the scene, you find their hair at the scene, you know, you put the pieces together, this guy must have done it, and generally they're right, okay, the vast majority of times they, they, after the trial, they're, they're right. But I suppose in a situation like that, you could get an innocent man executed. The Bible says nobody gets executed without two or three witnesses. So I suppose if somebody commits murder and all we have is circumstantial evidence, he should get life in prison. If we have witnesses, he should be executed. That would solve all the problem of these folks whining about what if an innocent man gets executed. But in the Bible, if somebody commits a certain crime, he's publicly executed. That makes a big difference. Suppose you had to take your son downtown to Square, uh, Seville Square, Pensacola, because some rapist is about to be executed publicly, tied up to a stake and shot, or electric chair, or whatever. It doesn't matter how they do it. What kind of impression is that going to make on that kid? On the way home, Daddy, what did that guy do? Well, son, he did, you know, whatever. You know what's going to go through his mind the rest of his life? I don't want to do that. <laughs> right? This guy in France was going to be, have his head cut off, going to put him up in the guillotine, cut his head off. And they're dragging him up the steps, you know, kicking and screaming. And somebody from the crowd hollered out, Do you think this is really going to deter crime? They said, It will for him. <laughs> it certainly will for him, won't it? Yes, capital punishment is a deterrent to crime. It's always a deterrent to crime for that individual. Every time, 100% of the time. And most of the time, it's a deterrent to the rest of the people who see it, too. But we got this dumb idea here in America, three strikes and you're out. Well, what about the victim's families? Now you got three, three families that are, you know, hurting and mourning, and for the rest of their life, their life is destroyed. It ruins things. I mean, if somebody breaks into your house and rapes and murders your wife, you've got to live with this the rest of your life. And there's a relief, there's a satisfaction when you see that guy executed. As long as he's locked up in a jail someplace, you're going to be a nervous wreck. And that's not right. That's not the way God intended it. God intended it for the person who commits certain crimes. I mean, read through the Bible. It's all in there. Certain crimes the guys executed. So here we got kids going through school shooting everybody, and the news media jumps on gun control. I think it's time to talk about public executions instead. Okay? Maybe it's time to talk about uh, the subject. Maybe all law-abiding citizens should be required to carry guns. There's a small town in Georgia. They passed an ordinance that says every household must have a gun. Crime rate went to zero. Nobody was robbed. What's that say to the criminals? Everybody in this town has a gun. Well, let's go to a different town, right? One of the large auto parts chains, I forget, it wasn't AutoZone, but one like that, you know. They passed a, a company policy that said no guns allowed in the store. So they put these signs up on the front door, no guns allowed. You know what that says to a criminal? Easy place to rob. That's what that translates into, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. Wow, nobody here's got a gun. Hmm. Suppose you put a sign up on the front door of your store that says, all employees carry guns. What does that say to a criminal? I mean, think about it, okay? We've gone crazy in this country. Gun control is not the solution. Criminal control is the solution. If ev suppose every teacher in that Colorado school had been required to carry a gun. You think those kids would have shot everybody? All that would happen, as soon as those kids start blowing up pipe bombs out in there on, you know, in the cafeteria or whatever and shooting everybody, any kid runs to any classroom. Teacher, teacher, there's a bunch of boys out here shooting everybody. Okay, kids, turn to page 37 and read it. I'll be right back. <laughs> and it's over. Now, I'm not in favor of, I've never shot anybody. I hope I never have to. But I have lots of guns. 
I have a concealed weapon permit. I often am armed. I taught my kids how to shoot guns when they were three years old. My daughter is a really good shot. Pity the guy that messes with her, right? <laughs> now, I, I, she's never shot anybody. I've never shot anybody. I hope I never have to, but I would. I decided while I'm cool, calm, collect, I'm not nervous at all. If somebody breaks into my house to harm my daughter, I'm going to shoot them. As many times as I feel like it. Period. Okay? <laughs> End of story. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Now, if you don't like it, well, then don't break into my house, and I won't shoot you. Okay? So, if all law-abiding citizens were required to carry guns, I mean, it's just something to consider. Why doesn't the news media even bring this up as something to discuss? Because some people would like a one-world government, a new world order, where only they are in charge and only they have guns and nobody else has guns. Lenin said, one person with a gun can control a hundred people without one. Watch the movie. The guy comes into the bank. He's got a machine gun. Everybody lay down on the floor. What's everybody do? They lay on the floor. Suppose everybody, just, as, just routine, suppose everybody carried a, a gun. And suppose the bank robber knew most of the people I'm going into this, most of the people in this bank have a gun on them. Law-abiding citizens, they're not going to shoot anybody, they're just going to defend themselves if they need to. Guess how many bank robberies we would have? Very few, right? It's a suicide mission, sure. I got a machine gun. Well, there's 50 people got a pistol. <laughs> One of them's going to blow your head off, you know. It just, it, it works. I mean, it just, common sense, it works, okay? Um, here's the logic they use to justify abortion. They're going to say, well, it's not a human. I'm sorry, that's not true. That's what your book's going to tell you, that it's not a human, it's just a fish. It has gill slits, it's a fish. That was proven wrong in 1874. It's not true, okay? It is a human the instant it's conceived. So that's not good logic to have an abortion. They're going to say, well, it's not viable. That viable means it can live on its own. And they're going to say it's not viable, so it can't live on its own. Well, you're not viable either, stark naked on the North Pole, you know. How long would you live on your own, <laughs> stark naked on the North Pole? Not too long, right? Just because it's not viable doesn't mean we have the right to kill it. I know kids that are 25 years old that still come home and borrow money from Dad. <laughs> Does that mean we have the right to kill them? Hey, Dad, can I borrow some money? <laughs> you ought to be able to live on your own by now, son. <laughs> Justifiable homicide. I mean, think about this logic. They're going to say, well, the child may be unwanted. Well, there's already kids that are born that are unwanted. Should we kill all of them? My parents moved four times when I was growing up, but I found them every time. <laughs> Just because it's unwanted. I mean, come on. Think about it. They're going to say, well, the child may be a financial burden. Every kid's a financial burden. Show me one that's not. I forget what the numbers is now, are now, but to raise a kid from birth up until about 18 is like $50,000 or something. It's unbelievable what it costs. Um, they're going to say the child may, may be from rape or incest. Okay, well, that's horrible. But why kill the child? Why not kill the rapist? Mm -hmm. Why do we always have to kill the child? Why don't we abort the mother once in a while? Why do we not even think of these things? A woman's raped, she's pregnant, okay, kill the baby. Well, no, kill the rapist. See, if you kill the rapist and then adopt out the baby, everybody's happy. That's the best possible situation. If you kill the baby, then the mother, the rest of her life, is going to mourn. There's going to be something in her heart, something in her conscience bothering her. She killed her baby. Now, many good good people have had abortions and they love God and it's not the unpardonable sin. And I don't want to make you feel, you know, like God can't use you. He can use you. Half the Bible is written by murderers. Moses was a murderer. God used him. King David was an adulterer and a murderer. God used him in a great way. But you, can, you don't want to justify this. Abortion is murder, plain and simple. Um, a doc, I was talking in, in this part of my seminar in a church one time and this medical doctor was there in the crowd and he got kind of upset. He said, now, Mr. Hovind, uh, Suppose a woman is raped and gets pregnant. Should she be required to carry that baby? I said, well, sir, that's a horrible uh, scenario, but uh, that's a good question. Let me ask you a question. You know, Jesus often answered a question with a question. I said, uh, sir, if a woman is raped and gets pregnant and has the baby, five years later, 
She's holding her five-year-old, trying to cook supper. The kid's been bad all day. Her mind flashes back to this horrible experience. How did I get this kid anyway? And she loses control for a few minutes, pulls out the steak knife, and <coughs> kills her five-year-old. Is it murder? Of course, right? Okay, what if she would have killed it five months after it was born? Would that have been murder? I said to the doctor, I said, what if she would have killed it five minutes after it was born? Would that be murder? He got real quiet. He could see where I was going. I said, what if she killed it five minutes before it was born? Would that be murder? Yep. Rape's horrible. The rapist ought to be executed, not the child. We're killing the wrong one. Okay, we got it all scrambled up. I, if they say we want free, you know, pro-choice, pro-choice. Okay, let's really choose. Let's pass a law in Florida. You can do this in every state. If a woman goes to have an abortion, the nurse will have a jar full of marbles. We're going to have a lottery. This will be fair, okay? We're going to put one marble in there that says baby, one that says mother, and one that says father. We will pick a marble to see who dies. Let's put one more in there for doctor, and another one for governor, and put several in there for president, okay? <laughs> How many abortions would we have then? Zero. Did you know every politician, without exception, every politician that voted for abortion has already been born? Think about that. Every politician <laughs> has already been born. Let's let the unborn children vote. What do you think, what do you think they'll say about abortion? Um, they're going to say, well, abortion's legal. Well, that doesn't mean it's right. Just because something is legal, doesn't, illegal in man's eyes doesn't mean it's legal and right in God's eyes. You know, in 1936, the German Supreme Court declared Jews living in Germany are not persons. If you live in Germany and you're Jewish, I'm sorry, you're subhuman. You're not a person. Well, guess what that says? If you kill one, you didn't kill a person, did you? You can't be tried for murder, can you? Because it wasn't a person. So when Hitler's guards were killing the Jews, it was not murder by, Jew, by German law. Perfectly legal in German law to kill the Jews. After all, they're not human. I've been to Germany three times. Fires me up every time I go there. I read lots of books about Hitler and the Holocaust just to keep my blood boiling. Uh, it was murder. Millions murdered. Why? Hitler thought the Germans were the superior race that deserved to rule the world. You know why he thought that? He believed in evolution. He thought, if one race is superior, it must be me, you know, obviously. And therefore, if we can eliminate these inferiors, that'll speed up the evolutionary process. It'll help the world out. He thought he was doing the world a favor. Um, Sir Arthur Keith, who wrote the foreword to Darwin's book when it was republished in 1959, he was, a, he was an evolutionist. Arthur Keith was uh, greatly honored, and they asked him, because of his uh, scientific ability, we want you to write the foreword to the book. So Arthur Keith wrote the foreword to the 1959 edition. I don't know if this is the one I have here or not. I should have looked. Uh, editor's introduction. I'll look later on that. But Arthur Keith said, the German Fuhrer has consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. What's that mean? Evolution says one race is superior. I mean, that's what Darwin's book said. So uh, let's find the superior race, eliminate the inferiors, and it speeds up the process. He wanted to develop a super race. Here's Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. I've got it in my library. I've read about half of it. I'm not quite done yet. It's full of his racist philosophy. He said in Mein Kampf on page 216, no more, does, no more than nature desires the mating of weaker with stronger individuals, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Who's a higher race, Adolf? Since if she did, her whole work of higher breeding over perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, this guy believed in evolution, might be ruined with one blow. Historical evidence offers countless proofs of this. It shows with terrifying clarity that in every mingling of Aryan blood with that of lower peoples, 
The result was the end of the cultured people. Who's an Aryan? Hitler, in this book, which I've got in the library there, while six million died, Hitler said uh, he was trying to make people realize the Jews are inferior. He said in a speech, I can only hope and expect that the other world, which has such deep sympathy for these criminals, notice he called the Jews criminals. You know what their crime was? Breathing air that belonged to Germans. Eating food that belonged to Germans. Taking up space that belonged to Germans. After all, they're inferior. They're taking up our space, eating our food, breathing our air. That's why he thought they were criminals. He said, I hope that if you have sympathy for these criminals, we'll at least be generous enough to convert this sympathy into practical aid. We, on our part, are ready to put all these criminals at the disposal of these countries, for all I care, even on luxury ships. Hitler said, you want the Jews? I'll send them to you. Roosevelt refused to take them. In 1938, in the late 30s, if you can get the immigration quotas in America, how many people can come from this country to America? How many can come from, you know, they had quotas. How many we allowed? Only so many thousand can come from, you know, this country and only so many thousand from this country, called an immigration quota. Go back and look at the quotas from the 1930s. You have blonde hair, blue-eyed, coming from Germany, hey, come on in. Coming from Norway, hey, come on in. Ireland, hey, come on in. Jewish, uh, no, sorry. Only a few thousand Jews were allowed to immigrate into America per year. Hitler said, you can leave Germany, but only take four dollars with you. Roosevelt said, you can come to America, but you've got to have ten thousand dollars. Well, that makes a little bit of a problem, doesn't it? <laughs> you couldn't come to America if you're Jewish unless you had, I think it was ten thousand dollars. They wanted to make sure you weren't going to come in and become part of the welfare situation here. Well, if Hitler says you can leave but only take four dollars, and America says you can come but only, to, only you've got to have ten thousand, that's a little problem to raise ten thousand dollars in one little short trip across the ocean, don't you think? That's how they stopped them from coming in. One boatload of Jews came to Havana, Cuba. This was before they were communist. Sat in the port in Havana and begged, "Would you please let us get off the boat? They're going to kill us back in Germany." Havana officials, here their relatives are right there watching them on the boat. The relatives on shore. Please let them off. No, nope. Havana says, no, nope, you can't come here. They sailed up to Miami. I think there were 916, if I believe the number, something like that. They said, can we please come to America? Miami officials turned the boat away. Nope, you cannot, you cannot get off. They sailed all up the east coast of America, stopping at every major port, begging for asylum, and were turned away. They went back to Europe. I don't know what happened to them. America was racist. Roosevelt refused to allow him to come in. Here's Hitler's hit list. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians, the Nordic, were close to pure Aryan, the superior race. Did you catch all that? Blonde hair, blue-eyed, Norwegian, born to the dog, the superior race. He thought the Germans, the brown-haired, blue-eyed, or less desirable brown-eyed, were predominantly Aryan. He thought the Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. The Slavics. Yugoslavia, you know, Ukraine. Would you be considered Slavic in the Slavic nation? Yeah. He said they're half Aryan, half ape. He said the Orientals are slightly ape. And the black Africans are mostly ape. And the Jews are close to pure ape. That's why Hitler killed the Jews. Because of his belief in evolution. If he would have killed all the Jews, guess who would have been next? <laughs> black Africans. Hitler hated black people. He thought they were an inferior species. Uh, anybody know where the Olympics were held in 1936? In Germany. in Germany. Guess who won the most gold medals? Jesse Owens, Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Hitler walked out of the stadium and said, it is unfair to make my men race against this animal. Just because he's black. Hitler was a strong believer in evolution. Acts chapter 17 tells us God made all nations of one blood. See, according to the creation view, we all came from Adam and Eve. Then later, we all came from Noah's three sons. So there's certainly no reason to be a racist and say, I'm superior to somebody else because of the color of my skin or because of the language that I speak. That's just flat silly. Okay, we all came from one blood. Last time I was in uh, Germany, I went to Nuremberg where the trials were held. After World War II was over, 
they got these, you know, German war criminals and had a trial. I was in the courtroom right there. You know what those, I wasn't there when it happened, obviously. Those guys in, there, in that trial, they said, we were only following orders. We did nothing illegal. They're, they're correct on both counts. They were following orders, and at the time, it was not illegal by German law to kill Jews. Perfectly legal. They were still convicted of murder, weren't they? See, there's a higher law than German law. God's law. And there's a higher law than U.S. law. God's law. In 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the word person, as used in the 14th Amendment, does not include the unborn. Guess what that means? Exactly what Hitler did in Germany. You're saying the unborn child is not a person, therefore it's not murder. Now, if you, if you find the egg of an eagle, an endangered species, and you take the egg out of the nest and destroy it. You can go to jail for a long time. But if you kill the unborn child and the mother, you don't go to jail. It is so crazy. There have been cases where a pregnant woman gets kicked by somebody, the baby dies, the guy is fined or sued or jailed for killing the unborn child. Well. Let's get it straight. How our Supreme Court can be so dumb, I don't understand. It's a child the instant it's conceived. I'm sorry, that's just logical. You know, in the Civil, I mean, in the Revolutionary War in America, only 25,000 Americans died. 400,000 died in World War II. 38 million have now died in America by abortion. That's the whole state of California. One thousand million, that's a billion, have been killed worldwide. Um, each woman around the world now averages one induced abortion in her lifetime, according to Scientific American this year. One abortion per woman. Well, now hold on a minute. I heard that the, in the Soviet Union the average is seven per woman. In China, it's in mandatory. You have, you're allowed one child. After that, you get pregnant again, let's go for an abortion. No questions asked. And in China, if you have a son, it's much more preferable to having a daughter. So now they're having just an enormous number of sons born and very few girls. They're going to have one restless population in about 10, 15 years over there. <laughs> Figure it out, okay? Hey, if he's not alive, why is he growing? If he's not a human being, what kind of being is he anyway? The Bible says, Cursed be he that take a reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. And abortion is murder. I'm sorry. Six things the Lord hates. One is hands that shed innocent blood. Anybody involved in the abortion industry? God is angry. Margaret Sanger started a group called Planned Parenthood back in 1916. She thought one of her goals was to eliminate the inferior races. She thought Orientals. Jews and blacks were inferior. She called them human weeds. We need to pull these weeds out of the garden to let the pretty races, you know, the blonde hair, blue eyed Aryans, you know, the desirable races succeed. Same philosophy as Adolf Hitler. Margaret Sanger said in her book, uh, the most merciful thing a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Their motto of their magazine, The Woman Rebel, was no gods and no masters. Birth control was used to create a race of thoroughbreds, according to her magazine in 1921. One of Hitler's doctors wrote an article for her magazine in 1933. Eugenics, sterilization, and urgent need. Eugenics is, this, is race control where, let's say, if somebody is mentally retarded, they should be forced to be sterilized so they can't have any more children that are mentally retarded. If someone has a certain disease, they should be sterilized so they can't have any more children. That's what, that's what he was arguing in this article, we should do this. And Hitler did that in Germany. Certain people were mandatory sterilization. Hitler referred to the Jews as a parasite in the body of nations. You read the literature today from the uh, pro-choice crowd, and they refer to the woman's unborn baby as a parasite in the woman's body. Interesting rhetoric, huh? 
One of their goals was to exterminate the Negro population. But she said in a letter, she said, we don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. We don't want them to find out about this. But that's one of their goals, was racism. Today they have a Negro president. She got the Humanist of the Year Award in 1986, Faye Waddleton. This document came out, we've got to quit after this. This document came out in 1952. Planned Parenthood document. Now look at this. How to plan your children. Your questions answered. What is birth control? Is it an operation? They said, no, it's not an operation. Is it an abortion? Look what they said in 52. Definitely not. An abortion requires an operation. It kills the life of a baby after it has begun. It is dangerous to your life and health. It may make you sterile. Boy, they've, they've changed their tune in 40 years, haven't they? Now 300 million of your tax dollars goes to support Planned Parenthood. Killing babies all over the world. Okay, next class we'll take up some more lies in the textbook and then eventually hopefully get to the point of what you can do about it. They got lies in your books, you're going to learn them starting this week. What should you do about it? We'll cover that later on. Join us next week. Welcome to uh, the last class of CSE 102. We will be, by now you should have taken your quiz from the class before, and then at the end of this class we will give you the final exam for you to uh, work on, and you can, folks taking this class at home, you should take the final after you're all done and then send it in to us and we will grade that. We're going to finish some more things. Uh, we began last week about lies in the textbooks. We covered a little bit about Hitler and his philosophy, Mein Kampf, his book that he wrote, which means my struggle, and in this book, Hitler uh, shows his racism over and over and over, and his strong belief in evolution. I have a doc covered in, or colored in many pages here. You can see Hitler's philosophy from his book. As I read it, it's, it's a boring book to read. I mean, the guy was a, a lousy writer, for one, unless they translated it wrong. It's, he's just, a, he wasn't too bright, I don't think. But he was really a motivator of people. Uh, so we're going to finish <clears throat> some more things, some lies in the textbooks that kids are exposed to every week. They go to school, they read these books, and they see things in there that have been proven wrong many, many years ago. And I, one of my hobbies is collecting public school textbooks. We're going to try to finish this section uh, th today. I don't know if we can get through it all or not, but we'll work on it. Um, they're going to teach the kids that the appendix is vestigial. Now this would be a quiz question. The word vestigial means you don't need it anymore. Uh, there are no vestigial organs, but they tell the kids the appendix is vestigial, wrong side. That means you don't need it anymore because our appendix is smaller than the corresponding organ on a horse, for instance. Well, our ears are smaller than a horse's ears also, and probably our legs are smaller, and probably lots of things are smaller if you stop and thought about it. <laughs> it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean we're slowly losing it. We just don't eat as much of the roughage that they do, and you don't need that to filter out whatever the appendix does. The appendix is not vestigial. Even the encyclopedias will tell you it is no longer thought to be a vestigial structure. It is where the immune responses are initiated. And people who take their appendix out have much greater susceptibility to leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, cancer of the colon, and cancer of the ovaries. You do need your appendix. Now, it is true you can live without it. You can live without both your legs and both your eyes and both your arms also. It doesn't prove you don't need them. Okay? You do need those things. This uh, textbook tells the kids that the whale has a pelvis that is vestigial. It says, just imagine whales walking around. It's true. <laughs> this is a book for seven and eight-year-olds. Whales didn't walk around. They show the kids the little bones in the abdomen of the whale and say this is a vestigial pelvis to say you don't need it anymore. This one says, uh, the whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. Well, that's just sheer baloney. You can see the little bones way in the back there. I'll blow them up for you. Right there are those little bones they're talking about. Those are not legs. <laughs> Can you imagine moving a 50-ton animal? <laughs> go in, go. You'd have to work awfully hard. They're not vestigial legs, okay? Uh, they never were. What those are, those little bones are places where muscles attach. And without those bones and those particular muscles, the whales cannot reproduce. 
You can't get any more baby whales without those muscles and those bones, so that's not vestigial. So any author that tells the kids the whale has a vestigial pelvis is either ignorant of his whale anatomy, and he shouldn't be writing a book about it, or he's a liar trying to promote a theory. Now, if you have some evidence for evolution, I would like to see it. I want to see it so badly, I'll give a quarter million dollars for it. There isn't any. All the stuff they show the kids in these books has been proven wrong. This one says, humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. Well, now, hold on a minute. You do need your tailbone, okay? There are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone. I've got Gray's Anatomy in there. You can come read it if you'd like. Those little muscles are essential for numerous different functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those little muscles and those bones. You need the tailbone. And uh, I tell them, look, if, when, I was in a debate one, with one guy, and he said, uh, he said, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, sir, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that, that attach to the tailbone. Um, and if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <laughs> it won't take but a few minutes and you will figure out, wow, that was a mistake. <laughs> we should not have done that. You do need your appendix and you do need your tailbone. There are no vestigial organs. Back when they started this concept of vestigial structures, they had 180 vestigial organs on the list. They said you don't need your tonsils, you don't need your adenoids, you don't need your pituitary gland, you don't need your... They had 180 things they said you don't need. Over the years, they slowly have diminished that down to none. I guess you need it all, okay? But they were so desperately looking for evidence for this dumb theory of evolution that they jumped on this vestigial structure idea. Now, think about the logic, though. Even if there were vestigial organs, there aren't any, but if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. Isn't that losing something, not gaining something? <laughs> now, how does that work? You lose everything until you have it all? I mean, you don't need to be too much of a genius to figure that out. That's not going to work very well. If something is designed, it demands a designer. Somebody designed these glasses. Even though it's 100% natural materials, it, there's a designer involved. If you're walking along the beach and you see a pair of glasses laying in the sand, you automatically recognize them as designed. You do not recognize them as a natural product of the waves beating on the sand, because glass is made out of sand, you know. It's just obvious there's a designer involved. This is, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group, Mount Rushmore. If you know of a bigger one, let me know. Stone Mountain's pretty big, but I don't know if it's bigger than that or not. Um, do you think there's any way these four faces could have appeared on this rock by chance? Do you think the wind could have done that? Or the water, erosion? Or maybe thermal expansion of the rock, you know, when it heats up it expands? or exfoliation where pieces flake off automatically? No, I don't think so. Exfoliation, by the way, Eric, if you use that term in uh, earth science, you see that at the bottom of every uh, rock cliff, like uh, the one we climbed in uh, El Capitan, El Capitan and Devil's Tower, there's a huge pile of broken off pieces. Every year, water gets up in the top in little tiny cracks. The sun will expand it and crack it. Water gets in and freezes, and pops off little flakes. Little pieces are constantly popping off every year, and they end up at the bottom in a big, huge pile. And that's called exfoliation. I don't know how to spell it. You can look it up. But uh, that's, <laughs> that's a process where this stuff, so I always say, do you think wind or water or exfoliation or thermal expansion caused this? No. This was designed by a guy named Borglum. It took him years and years to build it. Design demands a designer. The evolutionists have never come up with an answer to that argument. They try awfully hard, but they've never been able to answer the simple question, if something is designed, why don't you think there's a designer? There had to be a designer. What they're doing now in the books, and it's pretty tragic that kids have to face this kind of stuff. Here's a um, 2000 textbook. They are being taught that things have adapted to their environment. That's the word you've got to watch now. They use that phrase, adapted. This one says, how are plants adapted to their environment? Then it says, the pitcher plant has adaptations to help it get nitrogen. <laughs> Why don't they say it was designed? Would you say your car door is adapted to let you into the car? I think somebody designed the car door to let you into the car, right? <laughs> it's not adapted. Um, this one says, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Why don't they say a design feature? 
Well, they don't want to use the word design because then some kid's going to say, who's the designer? They don't want to have to answer that question. Now think about this. If gills are adapted, if fish have adapted gills to live in the water, how did they live before they adapted the gills? You say, oh, they didn't live. None of them lived. For millions of years, they all died. <laughs> That's real brilliant, right? Sure, toss them in, see if they can adapt some gills real quick. Yeah, sure, I've met a few like that. When you have a complex structure like a watch, I have a Casio databank stopwatch. It holds 300 phone numbers. It uh, is a calculator. It's a stopwatch. It's an alarm clock. It's a countdown timer. It does not tell time. You have to look at it. But this is an amazing machine. This is made of 100% natural products. There's nothing supernatural about this. There is not a little man inside here running around changing the numbers on the face of the screen. <laughs> it's all, it all works by simple electronics and mathematics and chemistry and physics. There's nothing supernatural about this. However, this watch is more than just the components. It's more than just plastic and metal and you know copper wiring and silicone chips. It's intelligence. It's design. And your body is more than just chemicals. It is designed. It reflects intelligence, intelligent design. Um, Walter Brown's pretty real good. He says, evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. <laughs> Think about that one. That's pretty good. Uh, a great book to read on this topic would be Darwin's Black Box. Uh, Michael Behe is a, a biochemist, and he goes into the complexity of things. It's a fascinating way he wrote the book, too. He wrote it in each chapter has two sections. Those who just want to get the simple idea is first, and then if you want all the details, the rest of that chapter is the go down deep, stay down long kind of stuff, where you can just skip that if you want and go to the, uh, to the next chapter. For instance, he takes an entire chapter describing the hair on a bacteria. A bacteria has a little hair on it that whips around and makes it swim through the water or through its little world. That hair has basically a rotary engine at the bottom that spins. That hair has 40, that, that rotary engine has at least 40 different parts to it. How many, what's the minimum number of parts to get an internal combustion engine to work? You have to have a piston, you have to have a connecting rod, a crankshaft, a wrist pin, something to hold the explosion, a head, Valve. valves to let it in, valves to let the exhaust out, a spark to set it off, some kind of electrical system. I would say, if you took, look at a little tiny uh, remote control airplane engine, for instance, very small, very simple, one cylinder. It doesn't even have the valves. It just has a port. The piston goes down, sucks gas in, squeezes it, throws it out, sucks in new gas. So you've eliminated the valves. Okay. What is the minimum number of parts you could get to have an internal combustion engine work? I don't know what it is, but it's probably around 100. Minimum number of parts. If you remove any one of those parts, it stops working. In uh, Behe's book, he talks about the mouse trap as an example. There are five parts that are required. If you take away one of those parts, it doesn't catch the mice. It doesn't work. And he challenges people, would you please try to um, design a mouse trap that has a spring, a hammer mechanism to hit the mouse, a latch mechanism to hold it back, a platform to nail it to, and staples to hold it down. He says this is called irreducible complexity. It has five parts. They all depend upon each other. You cannot take any one away without it ceasing to work. One atheist wrote him a letter and said, you're so dumb, I can reduce it to four parts. I can nail all those pieces to the floor. Well, duh, you just enlarged your platform is all you did. You, did, you didn't take away the platform. <laughs> they get pretty desperate. The idea of complex things that you can't reduce it anymore, it just simply stops working. Now, how many parts on your car have to be there to make it work? Uh, lots, right? How many ha can you take away to make it stop working? Any one of many thousands of parts, like the key, right? The ignition. <laughs> the oil, the gasoline. Uh, my dad, when he was in uh, Marines in World War II, he was in radar, and they would have to go into the islands after they took them from the Japanese, and they would set up radar bases. 
And one of the things they did for their training was, since this radar was operated by a diesel engine, their boss would sabotage their engine to make it stop working. And they had to see who could figure out what was wrong and fix it in the fastest amount of time. They would do all sorts of things to these engines. Of course, you pop off the distributor cap and run a pencil around the inside and put it back. Pencil lead is graphite, which conducts electricity, and the spark goes, goes to all the cylinders all the time. It well, doesn't run. He said the toughest one he ever had to find, they took a needle, took two spark plug wires that were touching each other, poked the needle through, and clipped it off and roughed up the rubber. So when it sent the spark to one, it sent it to two cylinders. And it ran terrible. And they could, it took them a long time to figure out why. It was a little tiny needle stuck between two spark plug wires. And there are so many things you can do for cars. When people get married, you know, you run the coil wire up through the, weave it through the fabric of the seat and the driver's seat. And then when they hit the key, <laughs> they get 20,000 20, volts in the gluteus maximus. Uh, we better not teach you guys all that stuff. Anyway, um, when they let go of the key, though, it stops. <laughs> and they wonder what was going on here. But this little, <coughs> excuse me, this little motor on this hair on this bacteria has at least 40 parts. If you take any one away, it stops working. So how did the individual parts evolve? And how did the bacteria know when it had 35 parts? Man, if I can just get five more, this thing's going to start working. <laughs> how did it know? There's no way it could know. It's irreducibly complex. By the way, that little bacteria motor is so tiny, 8 million of them, of these motors, would fit in the cross section of a human hair. Take a hair, cut it, the circle, 8 million of those motors would fit on there. Pretty tiny. And it whips around 100,000 RPM. 100,000 RPM, I don't know. I'm sure there are some things we have, you know, jet engines, turbines and stuff will go that fast. But like your uh, uh, Suzuki Katana 600 had what, red line of 10,000? That's true. 12,000 RPM, eight or nine times faster. And this big. <laughs> and it goes around so efficiently, it moves its little bacteria through the water the equivalent of a person swimming 60 miles an hour. Now you get a real serious problem. As an object gets smaller and smaller, the fluid that it swims in feels thicker and thicker to that object. It's almost like you swimming through peanut butter. 60 miles an hour. One breath? Uh, I don't know about the breath part. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, if that little bacteria can swim 60 miles an hour through its little tiny world, which has extremely high what's called viscosity. Viscosity would be a good uh, quiz question to ask. Uh, viscosity is the, the thickness of the water. If we had a long, tall uh, glass tube full of water and we drop a marble in, it would fall fairly fast. We could time it. Okay? If we take the same jar, fill it full of honey, drop in the marble, it falls much slower. Honey is thicker than water. Alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, is thinner than water. We could drop the ball in a tube of alcohol and it would fall faster. That has, that's called the viscosity. They measure motor oils with the viscosity. 30 weight, 40 weight, 50 weight. You know, 90 weight for the rear end of the car is very thick, heavy oil. Um, the, the, thickness the thickness of the liquid is called the viscosity. Um, there's probably a more technical term, the resistance to flow or the resistance to movement or something. But this little bacteria has to overcome incredible viscosity problems. And he moves I mean, I swam a mile one time in Boy Scouts in about 30 minutes. What's that? How many miles per hour is that? Uh, two miles per hour. <laughs> He's swimming 60 miles per hour. We need to sign them up for the Olympics. Um, and yet the textbook says, <coughs> we evolve from bacteria. Well, they're lots better off than we are. We're getting worse, not better. Charlie Darwin said in his book, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. Absurd. This is crazy. How can this happen? Even Darwin recognized this is a crazy idea because the eyeball is so complicated. And you go back again to the idea that design demands a designer. Charles Darwin said to many folks, you know, the eyeball confuses me more than anything. He said, I think this will be the undoing of my theory. This will be what proves my theory wrong. But well, there's a lot of things that prove your theory wrong, Charlie. Common sense will prove your theory wrong. But um, 
This textbook says the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Why doesn't God get the glory for what he made? Why do we all have to pay for the kids to be taught that eyeballs evolved when there's no possible way it can be happened and there's no evidence that it happened? So how are they, what are they going to do to the kids in this textbook? What they're going to do, they're going to arrange eyeballs of different types of animals in some kind of order from what they think is simple to what they think is complex. Some eye spots on different creatures only sense light. They're just a little sensitive patch. It just tells if it's light or dark. That's all they can tell. Okay. Some have extremely uh, good vision, like the eagle can read the newspaper at the other end of the football field, if he could read and he cared what's going on. Uh, but he has incredible vision. So they have arranged these eyeballs in order, and look what they tell the kids right here. You can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you can picture, if you picture a series of changes during the evolution of the eye. In other words, you have to imagine it. See, boys and girls, we'll arrange them in order. Can't you imagine how it could happen? Evolution only takes place in the imagination. Never takes place in reality. You have to imagine how it might have happened. The Bible says very clearly, God formed the eye. Psalm 94. I think God ought to get the glory. Did you know on the back of your eyeball is what's called the retina, the backside that receives the light. That retina has 137 million light-sensitive cells in one square inch. Uh, how, would you like, how would you like to be the electrician to wire up 137 million connections in one square inch? Remember the boxes we wired up for the duplication system, you know, trying to get in there with little, little wires together? <laughs> I remember as a kid, my dad got me a kit to build a ham radio, you know, shortwave radio to transmit as a transmitter. And boy, all those little connections in there, and now phew, they've miniaturized it much smaller. But even the fastest computer in the world, you get these big computers that have all these little microchips with these zillions of little tiny connections inside. The eyeballs got them beat by a long shot. And they think it happened by chance. If you think about the human eye that can not only, it can focus very quickly on different objects. I mean, what if you had a camera that could focus that quickly from one object to another? This camera Ken Andrew has back here is automatic focus. But if I stuck something up in front of the camera six inches away right now, it would take a fraction of a second to focus. Yet your eye can do it almost instantly. It adjusts for colors, more colors than any camera can ever pick up. Your eye can tell. You can hold up two different, or 20 different colors of white. I mean, go to the store and see how many colors of blue and white there are. How many shades of these colors. And your eye can see all this, more than any camera can see. And it, it adjusts for light, you know, the light intensity automatically, just bang, instantly. But it's pretty amazing the way it was designed. The uh, one atheist wrote me a letter and said, oh, no, he called me. I was, on the, I was sitting in the office. He called. He said, Hovind, you're so stupid. I don't know how you can believe in creation. I said, what's my other choice? He said, evolution. I said, what makes you believe in evolution? He said, well, the human eyeball is designed backwards. He said, it's, no, he said it's built backwards. It can't have been designed. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the light comes into your eye and it has to go, there's a layer of blood vessels in front of the retina. You can see the blood vessels on the top there. The light goes through those blood vessels before it strikes the retina, which allows you to see what you're looking at. I said, yeah, I knew about that. I taught biology. He said, well, those blood vessels block out some of the light. I said, yeah. He said, well, that's a poor design. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. Now he's right. Octopus blood vessels are behind the retina. Human blood vessels are in front of the retina. He's absolutely right. And he says that proves that we're, neither one are designed because it's backwards. I said, well, sir, listen, let me explain something to you. Uh, we live in the air. Air does not stop UV light very well, ultraviolet light. UV light will burn your retina. That's why you don't shine lasers in kids' eyes. That's why you don't stand there and stare at the sun for 30 minutes. The UV light will burn your retina. I said, octopus live in the water. Now, water stops ultraviolet light. That's why as you go deeper and deeper, the water seems to change colors. Only the blue light penetrates. Different frequencies won't penetrate at different depths. As you go down, it changes color until pretty soon, of course, black. Real deep, only the very, very dark blue light will penetrate. 
Octopus live way down deep. They don't need the blood vessels in front. They're not getting any UV light. So they're designed for the water and we're designed for the air because blood vessels block out UV light. I said, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you go ahead, but you'll be blind in a few days. I said, do you have any other dumb questions? He said, no, that was it. No, click. <laughs> I get that all the time. I try to be nice to him, but it's, you know, it, it'd be hard living being that dumb, you know? It, it is, anyway, uh, what they're saying is, you know, God wouldn't have done it this way, so it must have evolved. Well, maybe you just don't understand why God did it that way. Maybe that's your problem, okay? And even if that, you know, that'd be a lousy argument for evolution. Okay, I want to spend a little time on this one, the origin of life, because just about every biology textbook that I have seen talks about how life got started. First, they'll have a chapter on biogenesis, how that life only comes from life. Yeah, I saw that in the new Prentice Hall series about, yeah, life only comes from life. Then in the next chapter, they'll say, well, let's try how life started from non-life. <laughs> Just totally, it says, totally contradictory. No, no, of course not. They said Earth's atmosphere was different back then. And they talk about how it, they, they don't think it had oxygen in it. Right. We'll get into that in just a minute. All right. What happened in 1950s, a guy named Yuri and Miller, his uh, a student assistant, I forget which one was the student, Stanley Miller and uh, Harold Yuri. I think Stanley Miller was the student and Yuri was the teacher. Maybe I got him backwards. It doesn't matter. Anyway, he, was, he wanted to know how the Earth and solar system had come to be. Well, I could have told him that. I mean, it's right there in the Bible. But uh, <clears throat> he studied what he called Earth's primitive atmosphere. Now, right here is a major problem. They all assume that Earth did not have oxygen, like you said in the new Prentice Hall series they've got. That is simply not true. Earth's, Earth has always had oxygen. Even if the dumb geologic column were true, the oldest layers of Earth, the ones on the bottom, are highly oxidized. You know, when you drive through Georgia, the ground's all red. That's oxidation. That's iron ore in the, in the dirt. Iron, when it rusts, turns kind of a reddish color, iron oxide. Well, the oldest layers, by their twisted thinking, are still filled with iron oxide. Actually, more than we have today. <clears throat> Probably 30% oxygen. Today, we only have 20%. Well, so this, bus this business of Earth's primitive atmosphere is baloney to begin with. But what he did is he took these gases that he thought were in Earth's primitive atmosphere, and he mixed them together in his experiment. This textbook says, uh, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Oh, it's totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. Never happens. Um, this author said in uh, Encyclopedia, he said, origin of species not addressed in 1859 and is still a mystery in 1998. Both the origin of life and the origin of major groups of animals remains unknown. How did life get started anyway? Well, what he did, he took these glass tubes and flasks and stuff and he circulated gases through all these things and he had a spark that would go off in this chamber. The spark was supposed to simulate lightning strikes. And he says, see, if you had the earth full of this kind of atmosphere and lightning kept striking, it would supply the energy to unite these molecules. Well, let's just look at this now. Um, what he did, oh, hang on a second, pass through a little bit. Here, here's his picture, picture of what he did right here from Glencoe Biology, which I have uh, on the floor right there. He took methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen. No oxygen. He didn't want any oxygen in there because then you have what's called, there are two kinds of atmospheres. Oxidizing, which is what we're breathing right now, and oxygen will oxidize a lot of things. Cut an apple open, set it out for an hour, it'll oxidize and turn brown. Fruits, bananas, you know, it'll, it'll turn brown. That's called oxidizing. Uh, metal, if it's not protected, will oxidize. It'll rust. It attach, oxygen attaches to it. He didn't want any oxygen in here because he knew life forms might oxidize. That was his, his thinking on this. So he excluded oxygen. He said, it, this textbook says, he got a mixture that was rich in amino acids. That's what this textbook says. Now just hold on a second. Let's just discuss this for a minute. A letter of the alphabet would be called a building block to make a word. Right? Each of these is called a letter of the alphabet, and you put them together to make words. If I gave you a box full of letters of the alphabet, millions of them, and you dumped them on the floor, what is the probability of them arranging themselves to make a word? 
pretty small, right? What is the probability of them arranging themselves to make a sentence, even a simple sentence? The cat in the hat. What? Next to none. That's not going to happen. Okay. A letter of the alphabet is like an amino acid. It takes a whole bunch of these put together just right. Oh, one M. I taught science, not spelling. Okay. Amino acid. It takes a whole bunch of these to make a sentence. A bunch of amino acids in the right order will make what is called a protein. So you have to have a bunch of amino acids in the proper order to make a protein. Now you've got to have millions of proteins to make a cell. That's kind of the stages. This is like a letter of the alphabet, this is like a paragraph, and this is like a book. He was able to make a few amino acids. Oh, that's good. And they jumped to the conclusion, wow, he made life. Well, how far is a letter of the alphabet away from a, a book in complexity? Long ways, right? The, su the substance was not rich in amino acids. Here's what he did. He didn't come close to making life. He excluded oxygen because he knew life cannot evolve with oxygen present. It would oxidize whatever he made. And see, amino acids in the presence of ox oh. amino acids in the presence of oxygen will oxidize. They begin to break apart. So he didn't want any oxygen there. But there's a problem with this. Um, Earth's atmosphere has always had oxygen, and you have to have oxygen to, to create ozone, and ozone is what stops ultraviolet light. And UV light destroys ammonia. And ammonia was one of the gases he used. So if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, which means your ammonia gets destroyed, so now your experiment's back to zero. You're taking away one of your four building blocks in this thing. And which means life cannot evolve without oxygen. So it looks to me like you have a little problem. If life cannot evolve with oxygen and it cannot evolve without oxygen, it cannot evolve, which is what I've been saying all along. <laughs> it can't evolve, period. So it, you can see Michael Denton's book on page 262. He shows the evidence that Earth's, Earth has always had oxygen, even more than today. Well, what he did, though, when he circulated this gas through this system, the spark combined some of the gases and made amino acids. Oh, very good. It went to the bottom, and he had a special trap that would make it fall out. He didn't want it to go through again because the same spark was about 100,000 times more likely to take it apart than it was to put it together. So he filtered out the product. That's not realistic. What he actually made was 85% tar and 13% carboxylic acid. Now both of those are toxic to life. I don't make my students memorize a lot of numbers, but I do want you to know this for the quiz. What was the result of Miller's experiment as he tried to create life? He got 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. We'll just have the percentage for him to fill in, Marlissa. What percentage of carboxylic acid did he get? What percentage of tar? Just the numbers I want you to know. Let's see. 85 and 13 totals 98% poisonous substance. Poison. 2% amino acids. Now, there are some real problems here that students are not taught, and they ought to be taught. I mean, if you're really trying to teach biology, then let's teach the facts. He did not create life in the laboratory. He made the problem much worse. He demonstrated all we can get is a substance 98% poisonous to life. Now, there are 20 different amino acids. How many letters of the alphabet are there? 26. In the Russian alphabet, 30? 32 letters of the alphabet. How many different words can you make in Russian from those letters? Millions, probably. Well, hundreds of thousands of words, right? Uh, in English, 26 letters can be arranged to make hundreds of thousands of words. How many different ways can words be arranged in books? Unlimited. Infinite number. There is no limit. 
Amino acids, there's only 20 of them, like letters of the alphabet. You will need to know that. That'll be a quiz question. How many amino acids are there? They combine to make proteins. The smallest known protein has 70 amino acids. This is the smallest known protein with 70 amino acids. Think of a paragraph that has 70 letters in it. Uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Okay, that sentence contains all the letters of the English alphabet. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And that probably only has about 40, 50 letters. Okay? If I gave you a box full of all the letters of the alphabet, I told you I want you to dump them on the floor until you get that sentence, just by random chance. You'll never get it, will you? The problem really gets compounded when you figure the fact that letters of the alphabet have to be facing the right way. Amino acids are right-handed and left-handed. It's called chirality. You cannot put your right hand into a left glove. They look very similar. It's called a mirror image, though. It won't fit. These amino acids are mirror images of each other. Some right-handed, some left-handed. That's what he got. That won't work to create life, though. We'll show you that right after the break. Let's take a little break here, and we'll show you more about uh, making life in the laboratory. No, he did not make life. Didn't even get close. Coming up after the break. Let's finish up this, uh, with this subject of making life in the laboratory. What he was able to make was 2% amino acids. Half of them were right-handed, half were left-handed. It's like a, a left-handed uh, bolt and a right-handed, right and left-handed nuts and bolts, you know. You, you just can't put them together. The threads go the wrong way. Or right-handed gloves and, and go on your left hand. This is called the chirality. C-H-I-R-A-L-I-T-Y, I believe is the spelling. Chirality means the spin or the twist of the, of the molecule. Each one is twisted a little bit. And in order for them to fit, it has to be all the same kind. Only right-handed ones will link together to make a chain, or only left-handed ones. But you cannot mix them. Now, if you drop letters of the alphabet on the floor, half of them will be upside down backwards. Now, in, in America, if your letter R lands upside down, you cannot use it. In Russia, you can use it, right? <laughs> but not in America. Uh, and so some of the letters are OK if they're upside down. T, no problem. A, no problem. C, ah, this is problem. This cannot be backwards. This is not a letter of the alphabet. OK? So he ended up with half right-handed, half left-handed. Now the problem with this is um, the smallest proteins have 70 to 100 of these amino acids in a precise order and all left-handed. The DNA or the RNA molecules in your body are all right-handed. The uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, the small parts inside the nucleus of the cell. There's a zillion different parts. I've got a book I want you to look at just on the cell. One cell is more complex than the city of New York. To supply New York City, how many things come in? How many things go out? How much uh, movement is there within the city to keep things running smoothly? Unbelievable, right? One cell is more complicated than that. Stuff comes in, moves around within the cell, has to be transported back and forth. The book, uh, Darwin's Black Box, deals with that subject very well. That's an excellent book to read. Okay, so here Michael, or Miller and Yuri have a problem. They have several problems. They excluded oxygen, which won't work. They trapped out the product so it wouldn't go through again, which des destroys the whole experiment. And half what he made was right-handed, half was left-handed. These are at least three of the problems with his experiment. Um, and hundreds of amino acids must be made. And amino acids must combine to, call, to form a protein. And proteins, when they're in water, will come apart faster than they go together. They're more likely to dissolve than they are to bond together. And most people have recognized that the oceans are completely full of water. 
no doubt about it, all the way to the bottom. <laughs> and he wanted this thing to take place in the oceans with lightning striking. Well, you got a problem because your little molecules, once you get four or five of them to combine, they break apart. And you got to get a hundred of them to make one protein, and then you got to get a bunch of proteins to make a cell. And then who's this cell going to marry? There's some real serious problems here. Um, Brownian motion is named after a guy named Brownian. If you take a glass of water and put in one drop of red food coloring, very gently set the drop in there, what will happen eventually? It'll spread out. That's called Brownian motion. One drop of perfume in this room, the Brownian motion is the molecules are bumping into each other. And just because all the molecules are bumping, it'll gradually spread it out. So Brownian motion is going to drive his amino acids away from each other. It's not going to put them together. You would have to get so many of these amino acids in this ocean to get them to even find each other. It's not going to happen. Um, there's a couple of good websites about this that deal with this topic, but they somehow get this idea, you know, if we just get all the molecules together and add energy, it'll make life. I say, okay, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In a few minutes, you will have frog nog, <laughs> and you will have all of the molecules required to make a frog in one place. Now, we're going to add energy to this blender. We're going to hook it up to a turbine engine and run it 40 zillion RPM. We're going to nuke it and microwave it and hook up jumper cables and zap it. Anything you want to do, I don't care. You do anything you want. How long will it take to reassemble the frog? Wow. Never going to happen, is it? Millions and millions, millions, and millions of years. <laughs> yeah, even if you get it together, he's dead. Good point. That are dead. dead. Yeah, dead. on the highway. You know, about this big, about this thick. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so somehow, there, there's more to life than just the arrangement of the molecules. You know, an airplane is made up of millions of parts that cannot fly. None of the parts can fly. You put them all together, and it takes intelligence to do this, and then it can fly. The airplane does not fly because of what's inherent in the parts. There's nothing in aluminum that makes it fly. It's designed. And there's nothing in the molecules of the frog that makes it alive. It, there's a breath of life in there that nobody understands. Then they arrange them in order of how they think it happened. So getting from non-living material up to the first cell could not possibly have happened. Zero chance. Didn't happen. It's impossible. But they think it did. Okay. Now you have another serious problem because you have to increase the complexity of this life. It's interesting, in, in the world today we have zillions of one-celled creatures. They only have one cell. Then you have a few things that get together with colonies of cells, maybe 20 cells attached to each other, to work to, to they call it a colony of cells, a growth of these cells, 20. Why are there no two-celled living organisms anywhere in the world? It's either one or 20. And even 20 is not really a tissue, it's just a colony, it's a group living together. The next step beyond that would be a tissue which contains probably hundreds of thousands of cells. So where are the intermediates? Why, aren't there no, why are there no two-celled organisms? I ask this to evolutionists all the time, and they'll say, well, they must have existed, but there are no longer any left. Well, how come the one-celled ones survived and the two-celled ones didn't? We got lots of one-celled ones today. Why don't we find any fossils of two-celled organisms? Or three-celled, or four-celled? Where are they? They didn't exist, folks. It just didn't happen. Um, but the poor kids are going to be taught that it did. It's going to be, okay, it happened, and you better believe this. They teach that bacteria are simple life forms. Now, they're not, okay? And they slowly evolve to humans, which they say are very complex life forms. There's no such thing as a simple life form. But they arrange them in these trees, and it's just pure nonsense. Even people like Mary Leakey, Richard Leakey and Mary Leakey, the whole Leakey family, <coughs> good, good name for them, uh, <laughs> they spend all their time over at Africa digging around in the dirt looking for bones. Now, if you spent your lifetime digging in the dirt looking for bones, when you found one, 
you would want everybody to think it's important so they didn't think you were dumb for spending your lifetime digging in the dirt looking for bones. So they try to make a big deal out of this bone that they found in the dirt. And they will say it's the ancestor of all humans or something like that. And they've spent a lot of time digging in the dirt over there and moved, dug, up a lot of, dug up a lot of bones and dug up a lot of dirt too. Um, but they will say that these trees of life that are in our textbooks are just nonsense. Well, there's no evidence of this, one animal evolving to another kind of animal. Stephen Gould is the Marxist, communist, socialist professor at Harvard University. He said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are, are, have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. That means we infer. We think it happened. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. What they do is they arrange these trees all we see is the tips of the branches. The rest of the tree is imagination. They think it happened. They infer that it happened. Now this text, it looks to me like this Heath biology book is trying to tell the kids that the humans, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. Is that what you get out of that? How many get that? You see that? Okay. That's what they're teaching, right? Everything inside that outer circle is imagination. Nobody's ever seen any animal produce a different kind of animal. It's never been observed. Um, and of course, that teaching will destroy the faith of children who believe that. And it's sad that so many kids go to school and they're taught this kind of stuff and they end up going home with their faith in the scriptures destroyed because of a book that you and I paid for. Uh, Miller Levine, one of the worst as far as teaching evolution. Uh, every year it changes. It's having a race. Who can be the worst? You know, <laughs> they, they had the worst one time. Uh, this one, Glencoe Biology 94 edition, says all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. That's, of course, somebody's imagination. He says this is found in a population of, now watch this, primitive unicellular organisms. Unicellular means single cell, one celled organism. Well, one cell is made up of thousands and thousands of proteins. It's more complex than New York City. Each of those proteins is made up of hundreds of amino acids. They were able in the laboratory to produce a few amino acids, half right-handed, half left-handed, but only by making up an atmosphere that never existed on Earth. Didn't happen. Um, what is a primitive unicellular organism anyway? There is no such thing. They somehow think that because it is smaller, therefore it is simple. Now the problem is back in 1850s and 60s, Darwin and many people in that day believed that the cell was just a little glob of plasma. They thought it was like a little bag of jelly. That's all it is. They, could, they just had microscopes that could see the cells, but they couldn't see anything inside them. They couldn't tell much about them. They just thought, oh, it's a little glob of jelly, and your body's made up of millions of these all stuck together. So they thought the cell was a simple little bag of jelly. The more we've studied the cell now in the last hundred years, the more we've realized it is unbelievably complex. And the deeper you get into it, the more you realize each of the parts that are in there are incredibly complex. It's like you're walking into a, a shop full of tools. All of those tools is designed to do something. And you look at each tool, and it has a bunch of parts to it. Okay. Incredibly complex. A paramecium is a single-celled organism. You can put thousands of these into one drop of water, real tiny, but each one is more complex than a space shuttle. Smaller is not simpler. Microchip inside a paperclip. Pretty small microchip. This ant is holding a microchip. That little microchip can process every letter of the Bible 200 times in one second. 200 times per second through the entire Bible. I think the Bible has like three quarters of a million words. I don't remember how many letters. 31,000 verses or something like that. And it can go through every letter 200 times in one second. That chip is pretty small, wouldn't you say? Smaller is not simpler. Smaller is more complex. I, like, I use the illustration of comparing the Cray computer. Now, there's now a faster computer than the YPMC90, but at the time, the YPMC90 was Cray's fastest computer. Um, the Cray computer is huge. 
the brain of a honeybee is very tiny. The Cray computer does 6 billion calculations per second. They now have them faster than that. Um, the honeybee's brain is estimated to do a thousand billion calculations per second. Now think about what's going on in that honeybee's brain. He's flying along. That little tiny brain is keeping his heart beating, right? Keeping oxygen flowing through his body. How complicated is it to fly? He has to control the wings. Every muscle that attaches to his wings has to be told to contract, relax, contract, relax, thousands of times. And if he wants to turn left, if he wants to turn left, he has to tilt the wings. Ask any pilot, you know, go sit in an airplane sometimes. See how complicated it is to fly. That little brain is controlling all of that. At the same time, it is keeping track of every cell in his body to decide which one needs more oxygen. Am I getting too hot? Do I need to open up you know, to let some of the heat off? Like your body, you sweat when you get hot, you shiver when you get cold. Your body is controlling all that automatically. You don't think about it. It just does it automatically. At the same time, that bee is digesting the food that he ate. His brain is controlling that. And he's navigating by the magnetic field of the earth. And he's figuring out where to go find some nectar to make some honey to go back to the hive. Right. And they take the hive, I've heard people say that raise bees, the bee can fly around and they're so precise in their navigation. They will fly out to the flower, bzzz, get the nectar, fly back. On the way back, the beekeeper will move the hive over one inch. They will come and bump into where the hole used to be. Take them a minute to figure out, oh, the hole's over here, <laughs> and move over. Unreal. I saw one, uh, this guy took a, a wasp. This wasp had stung a grasshopper and killed it, and he was dragging it back to the hole to put in the ground for it to feed the kids. The, the wasp is programmed to check the hole to make sure nobody went in there while I was gone. He sets the grasshopper down, he walks over, looks in the hole, comes back to get the grasshopper and drags it down in. Well, this guy was sitting there watching this, and he got a tweezers, and when the wasp went over to check the hole, he moved the grasshopper. The wasp found the grasshopper, dragged it back next to the hole, turned around, checked the hole again, went back to get the grasshopper, but he moved it again. Something in his little brain tells him, I have to, check, I have to park the grasshopper this far away and then check the hole. He did it 40 times. The wasp never figured out. It's okay, the hole's fine. Okay, no, nobody's, in, nobody's in there. <laughs> hey, finally, the guy said, well, forget it. Let him take the grasshopper. So after 40 times, he never did figure it out. Now, you figure how small this honeybee's brain is, and estimates are it's doing a hundred, I'm sorry, a thousand billion calculations every second. Much faster than a Cray computer. The Cray computer uses lots of energy. Huge power lines feed that thing. One of the measures of a computer is how efficient they run. The honeybee uses 10 microwatts, which is very little electricity. The honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. I had a Toyota one time that got 44 miles to the gallon. I thought, wow, this is awesome. That was pretty good. They have Shell Oil Company, I believe, sponsors a competition to see who can get the best gas mileage out of their car. I read one year where some guy got 1,078 miles per gallon. He took his uh, car, took out all the windows so it'd have no resistance to wind flow or less resistance. He put airplane tires on there, pumped them up to 150 pounds of pressure, and then shaved them with a razor to make them as smooth and hard as possible. Little friction. Had a one-cylinder engine with a real long stroke. <laughs> one-cylinder, <laughs> real long piston and crankshaft. 1,078 miles to the gallon. He only went five miles an hour. That, the record now is probably like 1,600 miles per gallon. That's pretty good. Honeybee gets a million miles per gallon. And if you study the size of the honeybee compared to his wing size, he can't fly. But don't tell the bee that. He's doing pretty good, okay, without knowing, without that bit of information. Um, the cost of a Cray computer used to be $48 million. The br honeybee's brain is pretty cheap, okay? Uh, you splat them on your windshield all the time. Many people have to take care of the Cray computer. There's a whole room full of people just to babysit that machine. 
Nobody helps the honeybee. Here he is flying around with the most complicated computer in the world in his head, at least much more complicated than a cray. And he just flies around and does himself and reproduces himself. Absolutely unbelievable that this stuff happens. The cray used to weigh 2,300 pounds. I think they've got a way to cut that weight down now. But still, the honeybee's brain doesn't weigh very much. The computer is huge, slow, inefficient, costs a lot of money. You've got to babysit the dumb thing. And there's nobody with half a brain who would say the cray computer happened from an explosion in an electronics factory. But these same guys turn right around and tell us the honeybee evolved. And the human brain is much more complicated than a honeybee's brain. The human brain is millions of times more complex than a honeybee. Did you know your brain weighs about three pounds? And there are more connections between the cells in your brain. Each brain cell is connected to a bunch of other brain cells. There are more connections in your brain than there are electrical connections in the entire world. How many wires have been hooked together? How many wires have you hooked together in your lifetime? Quite a few, right? Either solder them or crimp them or twist a wire nut on them. That's called a wire connection. All of the connections, including all the little connections, how many are in a computer? You got this machine comes down, makes 100 connections at once, you know, in a computer circuit board. Figure all the connections in the world. Your brain has more than that. What does this chart do? This shows on the bottom is the memory capacity. How much information can it store? For instance, the British Library is a huge library. It has a lot of information stored in there. Your brain is about the same. Maybe not yours. The average brain <laughs> is <laughs> the average brain has more information than uh, the same information as the British Library, for instance. Now, uh, going up the chart on the other side is the computational power. How many bits per second can it process? The British Library has a lot of information, but you couldn't get it all out of there very quickly. How long would it take you to read all those books? Long time. Okay. The human, the elephant, and the whale are up at the top of the chart, way past the Cray computer. Yes, <laughs> one and one, right? Um, and yet they think this evolved. I, I look. I, I admire their faith, okay, but it's 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 ill-founded, okay. One professor told me we were in this debate one time, and I said, "Sir, do you believe your brain is just three pounds of chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years?" He said, "Yes, I do." I said, "Well, then tell me, sir, how can you trust your thoughts and the conclusions you come to? Maybe you've got a chemical in there backwards." <laughs> yeah, he did, by the way. <laughs> Human brain is unbelievably complex. Um, okay, DNA, we'll get into that next time. We'll take up our next class with DNA starting in CSE 103. And then hopefully we'll get into part five, which is the politically incorrect part on the effects of teaching evolution. Communism, socialism, Marxism, we'll get into all that when we start up CSE 103. Okay, Marlissa, make a note. We're going to quit right there on starting with DNA for the next class. Thank you so much for, so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, information.